Okay. Okay. Um, this is one of those chapters in the book of Revelation that I will not say it's one of the more important chapters of the book, uh, only because I, I think they're all equally important, and I think we need a good understanding of the whole book. Well, here's what I will say. Um, this chapter deals with a figure who is going to be a, an important figure during these last seven years of human history known as the Great Tribulation. Uh, this is a figure that we often refer to as the Antichrist, a coming world dictator who we first saw introduced back in chapter 6 when the first of seven seals is opened and judgments begin to be poured out on the earth. We see this rider on a white horse who goes forth conquering and to conquer. Uh, we spent a lot of time when we were in chapter 6 going back to the book of Genesis and sort of doing a comparison study between this coming world leader and Nimrod, who is an Old Testament type of the Antichrist, and how Nimrod, uh, his name means we will rebel. Um, there are a lot of legends uh, that say Nimrod was the one who invented the bow and arrow. We read that he was a mighty hunter before the Lord, the literal translation is he was a mighty hunter in the face of the Lord. It was a very um, rebellious sort of time. And he led that movement out in the, the plains of Shinar, building what was essentially a waterproof tower in the desert. And we talked about why, why would a group of people be building a waterproof tower out in the middle of the desert when God had promised he would never again destroy the earth with a flood, and it's because Nimrod had systematically convinced society at that time that God could not be trusted, that God was the bad guy, and that people needed to listen to him. And in a sense, this is what the Antichrist will do. The Antichrist, remember, that phrase, Antichrist, does not necessarily mean um, against Christ. It's a phrase that more literally means in place of Christ or instead of Christ. And the reason that's important is because if we think of the Antichrist, you know, if we take our cue from Hollywood, like we've said on so many occasions, you know, we'll think of the Antichrist purely as, you know, the opposite of Jesus. We'll kind of do the yin and the yang, the, the, the good side of the force and the dark side of the force type thing. Um, and we'll think, okay, well, here's Jesus, you know, pictured all in white, and he is the king of peace, and so here's the Antichrist. He's dressed all in black, and he's the king of evil. Um, actually, the Bible tells us that he will come on the scene, and he will bring peace, that he will appear to this world to be a savior. He will be very messianic. Uh, remember that what Satan desired all along was to be worshipped like God. That was the sin in his heart. He said, I will ascend, you know, above the Most High. And he wanted that, you know, we kind of see in from Old Testament passages how he was the anointed cherub who covers and he was perfect in all of his ways until iniquity was found in him. But there will come a point in time when this global leader, this antichrist, this dictator, this man who appears on the scene as a man of peace, there will come a point in time about halfway through the last seven-year period known as the Great Tribulation when he will sustain some kind of mortal injury to his head and will appear to come back to life. And at that point, Satan will bodily possess this leader, much the same way he did with Judas Iscariot. There was a point in time when Judas Iscariot was possessed by Satan. And there will come a point in time when this coming world leader will be bodily possessed. He will march into a rebuilt Jewish temple, and he will declare himself to be God, and he will demand that the world worship him as God, and those who don't will be put to swift death. It will be the largest persecution this world has ever seen during this reign of this Antichrist, who again, first comes on the scene and the world we read will marvel. Imagine 
a leader coming onto the scene with an answer for the economic woes that we face, with an answer for the, the Mideast conflict, which we said on Wednesday night is something we've been trying to resolve for decades, and we've never been able to do it. Well, this one will step onto the scene with, I have the answer. I know how the Muslims and the Jews can live at peace and how they can both worship on the Temple Mount. Imagine someone with that solution. The world will be like, wow, he's the one we've been waiting for. Now, look, I'll say this. There's all kinds of speculation when you come to Revelation chapter 13. And as I mentioned when I was doing the announcements, we're, we're going to do a lot of studying this morning. So again, I hope you got your thumbs ready. I mean, I hope you're just ready to track along with us because we're going to be doing a lot of comparing Scripture with Scripture because so much of what I'm going to be talking about is one of those things where people would say, okay, turn to a single passage and show me what you're talking about. I can't. Because so much of what we'll be talking about is a composite of several different passages where when we look at all of them, we get a picture of who this leader will be. It's a lot like saying, turn to a single passage in the Old Testament and show me where everything about Jesus is prophesied. You can't. They're all over the place. And so you have to study the whole thing to get a complete picture. Well, I believe that in a way is true of this coming world dictator. You have to be familiar with all of Scripture. On Wednesday night, we went back and we looked at Daniel chapter 9 and we spent a lot of time looking at Daniel's 70-week prophecy because that is important to our understanding of the book of Revelation. This morning, to go back and look at the, the, the dream that Nebuchadnezzar has in Daniel chapter 2, we, we need to look at that to understand who this leader will be, to look at the prophecies and Daniel chapter 7, regarding the vision that Daniel has of the four beasts. We have to go back and look at that to have a good understanding of who this leader will be. The term Antichrist actually appears nowhere in this chapter. In fact, it appears nowhere in the book of Revelation. The term Antichrist appears only five times in Scripture, and they're all in the writings of John the Apostle. In 1 John chapter 2, Verse 18, John wrote, Little children, it is the last hour, and as you have heard that the Antichrist is coming, even now many Antichrists have come, by which we know that it is the last hour. 1 John chapter 2, verse 22 says, Who is a liar but he who denies that Jesus is the Christ? He is Antichrist, who denies the Father and the Son. 1 John chapter 4, verse 3 says, Every spirit that does not confess that Jesus Christ has come in the flesh is not of God, and this is the spirit of the Antichrist, which you have heard was coming and is now already in the world. For many deceivers have gone out into the world who do not confess that Jesus Christ is coming in the flesh. This is a deceiver and an Antichrist. So we read here about many Antichrists. We read that there is a spirit of Antichrist in the world. But ultimately, there will be a figure who will embody this spirit that's at work. It will be the Antichrist. And again, we can see how the world is primed for this. I mean, even here in our own country, even for us as Christians, so often we are looking to whoever is in political office thinking they are the answer. You know, if you go back and... You know, again, there's been all kinds of speculation. I mean, probably not a president goes by that people don't take the letters from their name and try to add them up and go, look, there it is, 666, you know, it's him. Um, and I'm just going to say this. I don't, I don't think that any president we've seen up to this point is the Antichrist. I believe that the Antichrist will be a leader who emerges from what is often referred to as the revived Roman Empire, the European Union, which didn't exist until last century. We'll talk about that in a little bit. But will arise from that part of the world, but it just seems like with every political leader, more and more, the world reveres them as a savior. 
Now, again, I, I want to be careful not to polarize half the congregation this morning. I'm, I'm probably one of the most apolitical people that I know. Uh, trust me, when you live in Ireland for 10 years, you learn not to talk about politics because it's a very divisive subject over there. Um, so I am, I am not a politically minded person. I mean, I'm aware of what happens in politics, but I'm more concerned with what's happening in the Bible. Um, but I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to use someone as an example. Let me say this very clearly. Not to say he is the Antichrist. Okay? He's, I'm not saying he's the Antichrist. But when you look back at when former President Barack Obama was, was campaigning, you know, his whole slogan was, yes, we can. It was a, a tremendous message of positivity and change. And when you look at how the world really, not just in the United States, but outside the United States, you know, when you go to certain uh, news feeds from, from how he was embraced in places like Germany, you know, just coming off of a plane and people with their hands raised, it's, it's really a snapshot of who this coming world leader is going to be. I mean, I, I honestly think that, uh, you know, we, we, we read about how many antichrists have come. I believe in a lot of ways uh, Adolf Hitler is a type of antichrist. When you go back and, and look at what Hitler was able to do, in systematically convincing an entire society that an entire group of people needed to be exterminated. And he was very spellbinding with his public speeches and people literally hailing him. Okay, you know, it's, it's, it's one of those things where we talk about a coming world leader and we talk about the world worshiping him and those who don't worship him being put to death. And we think, that sounds so far-fetched. But can I remind us that Adolf Hitler was in power less than 100 years ago? I mean, go back and look at what was going on in Nazi Germany. That's a type of the Antichrist, but blow that out to the entire world. The global village will embrace this coming world leader. Okay, so an important figure, um, and I'll say this, Today, I'm, I'm hoping, I got, a, I, I got, you know, a place that I'm trying to get by the end of the Bible study. Um, we may not get there, okay? Today may end up being part one. My, my original intention was, today was going to be the Antichrist, next Sunday we're going to look at the false prophet, who's another character that factors into this whole thing. Today may end up being the Antichrist part one, and next week the Antichrist part two. Um, but we'll see, because what happens is there will come a point in time when I will either just have to go for it and commit and kind of jump out of the plane and pull the chute, or I'll just have to stop and slam on the brakes and we'll pick it up next week. So um, we won't vote on who wants what. So, <clears throat> all right, John sees in chapter 13, verse 1, he says, then I stood on the sand of the sea and I saw. Now, where we were in chapter 12 this past Wednesday night. By the way, if you weren't here, again, let me, go, let me encourage you to go back and listen to that study because the first half of the study was really a recap of all the stuff we've co covered up to this point, which I'm not going to take time to do today. It's one of those things where, you know, week to week, we can't continue to just spend time talking about what we've covered. My encouragement is go back and do all the studies. You'll catch up. But I will say this, in chapter 12, John was really dealing with, with drama that was taking place in the heavenlies. You remember, he says, I saw war break out in heaven. He, saw, I saw, he said, I saw a sign in the heavens, a woman about to give birth. So he was really seeing a heavenly perspective, but now, this week, he is seeing what's happening on the earth. And he's describing more of an earthly perspective. And he says, I stood on the sand of the sea... And I saw a beast. The, the word there is actually a wild beast. It has the idea of a ferocious nature. He says, I saw a beast rising up out of the sea. Now, we have a tendency to think of the sea as a very desirable place to go. You know, if we have an opportunity to get away, 
you know, how, where can we go to the beach? You know, how much does it cost to go on vacation there? It's a good place to go and relax. But to the ancient Hebrews, the sea was a place that was associated with chaos. It was a place that was associated as being very, very rebellious. Uh, if you go back and you read through a lot of the Psalms, you see references to this. So when John pictures the sea and and there's debate over whether or not this is specifically the Mediterranean Sea because, again, in John's day, when they would write about the sea, they were talking more about the Mediterranean Sea than anything else. But he sees this beast rising up out of this rebellious place. It's a picture of humanity. And he says of this beast that he has seven heads and ten horns, and on his horns, ten crowns, and on his heads, a blasphemous name. Now, this beast, in Revelation chapter 13, appears very, very similar to the dragon back in chapter 12 that we read in verse 3 had seven heads and ten horns. And, And we know that the dragon in chapter 12 is Satan. We're told that very clearly in verse 9 of chapter 12, that the dragon of chapter 12 is the serpent of old, the devil, and Satan, who, again, we read here as having seven heads and ten horns, but note very specifically in chapter 12, verse 3, that of the dragon, there are seven diadems on his heads. And of the beast, in chapter 13, verse 1, we read that on the horns of the beast, there are ten crowns. Okay, so of the dragon, he's got seven heads and ten horns, and it's on his heads that are the crown. But this beast has seven heads and ten horns, but it's on the horns where the crowns are. So this beast features a lot of similarity to the dragon. And we'll find out a little bit later in our study that the dragon will give to this beast all of his authority. So there's a lot of similarity in his nature and his characteristics between the beast and the dragon, but I believe they are separate because of the differences that we see. Now, verse 2, John says, The beast which I saw was like, okay, there another important word in the book of Revelation. John's not specifically saying, I saw a leopard. He's saying, I saw a beast that looked like this. He says, The beast which I saw was like a leopard, His feet were like the feet of a bear, and his mouth like the mouth of a lion. The dragon gave him his power, his throne, and great authority. And here's what I mentioned earlier. John says, I saw one of his heads as if it had been mortally wounded, and his deadly wound was healed, and all the world marveled and followed the beast. I believe one of the reasons that the world will ultimately embrace this coming world leader as a messianic figure and go along with the idea of worshiping him is because of what we read here. That there will be some kind of, some have even suggested maybe it's an assassination attempt. I don't know. I do know this. If you go back and you look at some of the pictures that were taken after John F. Kennedy was shot. I mean, imagine that event and how that impacted not only our nation, but the world. Imagine if three days later, John F. Kennedy was up and walking around again. The world would have completely marveled. The world would have said, there's something supernatural about this person. The Jews are waiting for this person. They do not believe that Jesus Christ was the Messiah, so they are waiting for a coming Messiah. And they will view this coming world leader as their Messiah. And they will be deceived. Now, come with me, if you would, real quick to chapter 17. Uh, Let me just kind of flash forward. A lot of similarities between chapter 13 and chapter 17. You can, again, sort of compare Scripture with Scripture. Uh, Let me just pick it up there in verse 8. You find another reference to this idea that the beast is... um, Hang on a second. Let me mark where I just was. You see a a reference here to the idea of the beast sustaining this wound. Chapter 17, verse 8. John says, The beast that you saw was and is not, 
and will ascend out of the bottomless pit. We read about the bottomless pit in one of our previous studies. And go to perdition. And those who dwell on the earth will marvel, whose names are not written in the book of life from the foundation of the world, when they see the beast, check this out, that was and is not and yet is. Okay, that's a way of saying he was alive, he was dead, now he's alive again. He was, he is not, and he yet is. Here is a mind that has wisdom. The seven heads are seven mountains on which the woman sits. Okay, so we get a little bit of an interpretation in chapter 17 about the beast that John has seen. We're not going to talk about the woman today. That's another whole study. Okay, so we'll talk about that when we get to chapter 17. But we are told very specifically in verse 9 of chapter 17 that the seven heads are seven mountains on which the woman sits. Now, many Bible commentators over the years have looked at this verse and have built the perspective that because of this reference, that this upholds the idea that the Antichrist, the seat of his government, will somehow be situated in Rome. Because Rome throughout antiquity was referred to as the city on seven hills. Um, I'll say this, there's some, there is some merit to that. There's some merit to the idea that, again, the revived Roman Empire and the city of Rome, that there's some merit to the idea that the Antichrist government would be seated in the, in the city of Rome. Um, in fact, I would even say this, especially, and we'll talk about this in, in coming studies, especially when you start looking at the idea of the Antichrist's government being very t tied to um, Islam, and there is a verbalized agenda within Islam to turn St. Peter's Basilica in Rome into the largest mosque in Europe. I mean, they've said very straight up, that's what, that's what we're going to do. And so we'll talk about a possible partnership that may come about between Islam and the Roman Catholic Church as an institution. Um, again, I'm kind of getting ahead of myself, but I, I say all that to just kind of give you a snapshot of what's coming, but, but also to suggest that it's possible the Antichrist government will be situated in Rome. Jump down to verse 12. Um, we're told the ten horns which you saw are ten kings who have received no kingdom as yet, but they receive authority for one hour or a short time as kings with the beast. We'll talk a little bit more about these ten kings. Who are these ten kings? Um, when John sees this beast with ten horns, um, and we'll talk about this from Daniel as well, that the ten horns are ten kings, uh, that the Antichrist's government will somehow be tied to a confederation of ten kingdoms or ten nations. A lot of people, again, have suggested, okay, the revived Roman Empire, it's, it's the European Union. And, but then people say, well, but the European Union's got more than ten, you know, nation states, so it can't possibly be the EU. And I would say this, that in the day and age that we live in, anything's possible. Uh, you know, in, in the day and age where California wants to secede from the Union, you know what I mean? Like, it would not surprise me if things change radically on the geopolitical scene to where Europe gets reshuffled and it ends up being a ten-nation confederacy. Uh, or there may be, you know, unions between some of the countries. It, it may not specifically be the European Union as a whole. Did you know that until the early 2010s, or maybe it was the early 2000s, I got to go back and look at my dates because I got a lot of dates floating around in my head, but there was a separate confederation to the European Union known as the Western European Union. Have you ever heard about the Western European Union? Okay, most people haven't. But the Western European Union was a lot of the main deciding countries within the European Union, and there were 10 of them. So that's interesting. Uh, you know, and we could start to speculate and talk about things like Recommendation 666, right? 
where the EU has a clause that in a military emergency, they can vote um, executive power to a single leader. So there's all kinds of stuff, you know, right? We could go back and we could talk about the bottomless pit, you know, being what's happening in CERN, Switzerland, you know, at the, at the Hadron Collider, where they're shooting protons at each other three times the speed than they've ever done up to this point, and that their stated agenda, and it's really weird to watch scientists talk about the fact that they want to rip a hole into another dimension. And they want to create a black hole. Well, what is a black hole? It's a bottomless pit. In fact, it's been quoted, one of the, one of the scientists, well, you know what, don't quote me on that. I, I don't even know if I should say this. People are like, you better say it now. No, I, I don't know. I just know that they've, they've said very specifically how they want, they're, they're, they're hoping to go back and, and recreate um, the exact conditions that existed at the creation of the world. That's what they want to duplicate. And um, one author, I'll say it that way, one author stated uh, they want to go back and do this, and they said, or at least to the time before God locked up all the demons. And I thought, well, that's interesting because it talks about the bottomless pit being open and all these demonic locusts coming out of the bottomless pit. You know, so again, we live in this really bizarre time, you know, but it's an exciting time because there's a lot of stuff happening when you start really looking at what's happening. And a lot of this stuff doesn't necessarily make headline news. And people are like, dude, I don't know what you've been watching, you know. <laughs> But, but the whole thing, I mean, in CERN, I mean, it's, it's very published. Uh, what's really weird is to go back and look at their, their opening ceremony and see the dude dressed like a goat dancing around and the chanting that they're doing. It's, it's very demonic. It's weird, 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 weird time. People are like, uh, that thing you said about being done, you need to stop right now. <laughs> you need to get out of here. Okay. So come back to verse 12 of chapter 17. The ten horns which you saw are ten kings who have received no kingdom as yet, but they receive authority for one hour as kings with the beast. So it's possible that the beast himself creates these ten kings. That's another possibility. Verse 13 says, These are of one mind, and they will give their power and authority to the beast. These will make war with the lamb, and the lamb will overcome them, for he is Lord of lords and king of kings, and those who are with him are called chosen or called chosen and faithful. Then he said to me, the waters which you saw where the harlot sits are peoples, multitudes and nations and tongues. So we're told in this chapter what the seven um, heads are, what the ten horns are, and what the waters are. John sees a beast coming up out of the sea or out of the waters with seven heads and ten horns. Well, we're told here what the waters are. The waters are peoples, multitudes, and nations, and tongues. The seven heads are seven mountains, and the ten horns are ten kings who will give their authority to the beast. And it says in verse 16, And the ten horns which you saw on the beast, they will hate the harlot, make her desolate and naked, eat her flesh, and burn her with fire. Okay, come back to chapter 13. We won't talk about all that today. John says in verse 3, he says, I saw one of his heads as if it had been mortally wounded, and his deadly wound was healed, and all the world marveled and followed the beast. So they worshipped the dragon who gave authority to the beast. So again, the dragon is Satan in chapter 12. So here Satan is finally achieving what he wanted all along, which is to be worshipped. Uh, and he's doing it through this political leader, when he gives that political leader all of his authority, it says all the world worshipped the dragon, in verse 4. They worshipped the dragon who gave authority to the beast, and they worshipped the beast, saying, who is like the beast? Uh, by the way, I don't believe the world's going to refer to this leader as the beast. I think that would be pretty obvious, you know what I mean? Um, but who is, who is like the beast? Who was able to make war with him? And he was given a mouth, speaking great things and blasphemies. And he was given authority to continue, check this out, for 42 months. How long is 42 months? Three and a half years, right? 
A time, times, and half a time. 1,260 days. That number, that length of time, factors into the book of Revelation very predominantly. It's the last three and a half years after the Antichrist declares himself to be God. He commits what Jesus refers to as the abomination of desolation spoken of by Daniel the prophet, declaring himself to be God, demanding that the world worship him as God. From that point on, breaking that peace treaty with the nation Israel, from that point on, there will be 42 months left until Jesus comes back. 1,260 days, three and a half years, a time, time, and half a times. Then, verse 6 says, he opened his mouth in blasphemy against God to blaspheme his name, his tabernacle, and those who dwell in heaven. It was granted to him to make war with the saints and to overcome them, and authority was given him over every tribe and nation, and all who dwell on the earth will worship him, whose names have not been written in the book of life, of the Lamb slain from the foundation of the world. If anyone has an ear, let him hear. Verse 10 says, He who leads into captivity shall go into captivity. He who kills with the sword must be killed with the sword. Here is the patience and the faith of the saints. Let me just, if I may, regarding verse 10, I'm just going to quote Bible commentator David Guzik on this because I think he sums it up great. Because a lot of people see this phrase in verse 10, this whole idea of, Whoever leads into captivity will go into captivity. David Guzik writes this, The functionaries of the beast are not without guilt. Through the, though these things are prophesied as part of God's plan, it does not lessen in the slightest way man's personal responsibility. If you work for the beast and lead others into captivity, you certainly shall go into captivity yourself. God will reward the persecutors of the saints with persecution of his own. So that's kind of what you see there in verse 10. Okay, I've reached that point. What do you think? Do you want to keep going or come back next week? I, you shouldn't even throw that out there because half the room's going to be like, keep going. The other half's going to be like, go home. Um, we can try this. I, I do have a clock up here. I put a clock up here for myself. <laughs> Amen. Amen. Um, <clears throat> Come with me, if you would, real quick to the book of Daniel. Okay, let's start in Daniel chapter 2. John sees this beast. Seven heads, ten horns, and it's got characteristics of a leopard, a bear, and a lion. It's a ferocious beast, okay? We see a lot of stuff in the book of Daniel that helps us learn a little bit more about who this beast is that John sees. Daniel chapter 2, um, a lot of people are very, are very familiar with this passage. This is when a Babylonian king by the name of Nebuchadnezzar is plagued by a particular dream that he had. And he sends for all of the soothsayers and, you know, uh, wise men of his nation, and, and no one can give him the interpretation of the dream. So finally, somebody comes to him and says, well, there is a young man who could probably give you the interpretation of the dream. And so it's Daniel. And so Daniel chapter 2, um, in verse 27, Daniel is about to give, well, he's going to do two things. He's not only going to give Nebuchadnezzar the interpretation of the dream, he's going to tell him what the dream was, which is pretty impressive. Because up to this point, you know, Nebuchadnezzar's just been having people come to him and say, tell me what the interpretation of my dream was. Daniel's going to come in and he's going to say, well, first of all, here's what you dreamed and here's what it means. Okay, so verse 27 of Daniel chapter 2, Daniel answered in the presence of the king and said, the secret which the king has demanded, the wise men, the astrologers, the magicians, and the soothsayers cannot declare to the king, but there is a God in heaven who reveals secrets and he has made known to King Nebuchadnezzar, watch this, what will be in the latter days. Okay, so what King Nebuchadnezzar dreamed about is actually in relation to the latter days or the end times. Your dream and the visions of your head upon your bed were these. As for you, O king, thoughts came to your mind while on your bed about what would come to pass after this. And he who reveals secrets has made known to you what will be. But as for me, this secret has not been revealed to me because I have more wisdom than anyone living, but for our sakes who make known the interpretation to the king and that you may know what the thoughts of your heart you may know the thoughts of your heart. You, O king, were watching, and behold, a great image. Uh, and we've got uh, a 
slide we can put up here kind of to help picture what Daniel sees or what Daniel is telling King Nebuchadnezzar that he saw. It says, you were watching, verse 31, and behold, a great image. This great image, whose splendor was excellent, stood before you, and its form was awesome. This, image head, this image's head was of fine gold, its chest and arms were of silver, its belly and thighs of bronze, its legs of iron, now note this, its feet partly of iron and partly of clay. So King Nebuchadnezzar has this dream of this huge statue, the head is a head of gold, the arms and the chest were, were silver, the belly and thighs were bronze, and then, this is the interesting part, he sees legs of iron, but then he sees down in the feet, they're partly of iron and partly of clay. Now, the feet are an extension of the legs, right? Um, right? Yeah, they're connected to our legs, right. Um, <clears throat> just making sure. Um, iron is the strongest of these metals. So one of the things that Daniel's about to tell him is these each represent an earthly kingdom. And the fourth kingdom is actually the strongest of all of these kingdoms, which he pictures. But here's the interesting thing. The fourth kingdom, which is this pictured by these legs of iron, It'll be the Roman Empire. Again, we'll talk about that in a moment. There will be a kind of extension of the Roman Empire or a continuation of the Roman Empire, but it won't be the same thing because it'll be partly mixed with clay. Okay, The Roman Empire, in a sense, ended in a formalized sense, but there will be a revived Roman Empire. This is where you kind of get that whole idea from that the Roman Empire will continue, but how many horns did John see on the beast? He saw ten horns, right? Here, Nebuchadnezzar has a dream with ten toes in this final kingdom. So there's a lot of correlation here. So let's keep reading. Uh, verse 34, he says, You watched while a stone, this is the great part, while a stone was cut out without hands, which struck the image on the feet of iron and clay and broke them in pieces. So Jesus Christ is going to come back and is going to strike this final kingdom, which is an extension of the Roman Empire, but it won't be as strong as the Roman Empire. Then, verse 35, the iron, the clay, the bronze, the silver, and the gold were crushed together and became like chaff from the summer threshing floors. The wind carried them away so that no trace of them was found, and the stone that struck the image became a great mountain and filled the whole earth. And, of course, that's Jesus coming back and setting up his kingdom the kingdom of God. This is the dream, he says. Now we will tell you the interpretation of it before the king. So this is the dream, this image. Head of gold, chest of silver, belly and thigh of bronze, legs of iron, and then feet partly of iron and partly of clay. Verse 37, here's the interpretation. He says, you, O king, are a king of kings, for the God of heaven has given you a kingdom, power, strength, and glory. And wherever the children of men dwell, or the beasts of the field, or the birds of the heaven... He has given them into your hand and has made you ruler over them all. You are this head of gold. Okay, so that, that helps. Where's that second image? Okay, so the, the head of gold is the kingdom of Babylon. We know that. We're told it right here. I love when the Bible interprets itself. Okay, so what commentators see and what Daniel's about to talk about is that if Nebuchadnezzar and Babylon is the head of gold, then there is a picture of succeeding world kingdoms that follow after Babylon. And the kingdom of Babylon existed from about uh, 605 B.C. until 539 B.C. Okay, then in verse 39, he says, but after you shall arise another kingdom inferior to yours, that's the chest of silver, the Medo-Persian Empire, then another, a third kingdom of bronze, that's the Greek empire, which shall rule over the earth. Now, verse 40, and the fourth kingdom shall be as strong as iron inasmuch as iron breaks in pieces and shatters everything. In other words, it's the strongest of these metals. And like iron that crushes, that kingdom will break in pieces and crush all the others. Now, verse 41, whereas you saw the feet and toes, partly of potter's clay and partly of iron, the kingdom, and this is the extension of that final, that fourth 
dominating world empire. What we'll see in the last days. This reconfiguration of the Roman Empire, this extension of the Roman Empire, it'll have elements of Rome, partly of iron, but but not as strong. It'll be partly of clay. It will be divided, verse 41 says. There's the ten toes. Yet the strength of the iron shall be in it, just as you saw the iron mixed with ceramic clay. And as the toes of the feet were partly of iron and partly of clay, so the kingdom shall be partly strong and partly fragile. Okay, so this final dominating world empire under the leadership of the Antichrist will be similar to ancient Rome, but it won't be as strong. It'll have elements of the iron, but it'll be mingled with clay. Partly strong, partly fragile. Verse 43 says, As you saw iron mixed with ceramic clay, they will mingle with the seed of men, but they will not adhere to one another, just as iron does not mix with clay. And in the days of these things, So here again, we see Jesus Christ coming back and shattering this final kingdom. In the days of these things, the God of heaven will set up a kingdom which shall never be destroyed. And the kingdom shall not be left to other people. It shall break in pieces and consume all these kingdoms, and it shall stand forever. Inasmuch as you saw that the stone was cut out of the mountain without hands, and that it broke in pieces the iron, the bronze, the clay, the silver, and the gold, the great God is made known to the king, What will come to pass after this? The dream is certain and its interpretation is sure. Okay, so that's what King Nebuchadnezzar dreamed. And then Daniel is able to give us the interpretation. That after the Babylonian Empire, there will be three more world-dominating empires. The Medo-Persian, the Greeks, finally the Roman Empire. But then in the ten toes, the feet partly of iron, partly of clay, This final world empire, the empire that the Antichrist will lead, the ten kings, right? The ten horns who will give the Antichrist their power. It'll have elements of Rome, but it won't be as strong. And it will be Jesus Christ who comes back and strikes, boom, and puts an end to all of these world-dominating empires and sets up his kingdom, which will last forever. Okay? Now, leaving Daniel chapter 2, come with me, if you would, to Daniel chapter 7. Daniel sees another vision. Well, hang on, I shouldn't say that. Daniel doesn't see a first vision. Nebuchadnezzar had a dream. But Daniel is able able to tell Nebuchadnezzar what that dream meant. Okay, now Daniel is going to have a vision, a separate vision. And here's the thing, it's a vision of a beast. Okay, John this morning saw a vision of a beast in Revelation chapter 13. Daniel chapter 7, let me... Lubricate up here real quick. All right, here we go. In the first year of Belshazzar, king of Babylon, Daniel had a dream and visions of his head while on his bed. And then he wrote down the dream telling the main facts. Daniel spoke saying, I saw in my vision by night and behold, the four winds of heaven were stirring up. Oh, this is interesting. The great sea. Where did John see his beast coming from? Coming out of the sea. Daniel here sees a beast coming out of the sea. And four great beasts came up from the sea, each different from the other. Now check this out, verse 4. The first was like a lion and had eagle's wings. I watched till its wings were plucked off and it was lifted from the earth and made to stand on two feet like a man and a man's heart was given to it. Suddenly another beast, a second, like a bear. It was raised up on one side and had three ribs in its mouth between its teeth. And they said thus to it, arise, devour much flesh. After this, I looked and there was another like a leopard, which had its had on its back four wings of a bird. The beast also had four heads and dominion was given to it. Okay, so John this morning had a vision of a beast coming up out of the sea and it had elements of a leopard, a bear and a lion. Daniel here sees coming up out of the sea four separate beasts, one's like a lion, one's like a bear, and one's like a leopard. So immediately we know these things are connected. Okay, now the final beast, verse 7. Daniel says, After this I saw in the night visions, and behold, a fourth beast, dreadful and terrible, exceedingly strong, it had huge iron teeth. Now remember the iron legs. 
of the dream which Nebuchadnezzar had, the image of gold that he had seen. It had huge iron teeth. It was devouring, breaking in pieces, and trampling the residue with its feet. It was different from all the beasts that were before it. And check this out. And it had ten horns. Okay, so John this morning again, in Revelation chapter 13, has a vision of a beast. It's got elements of a lion, a bear, and a leopard, and it has ten horns. Daniel this morning sees coming up out of the sea one beast like a lion, one beast like a bear, one beast like a leopard, but then he sees a fourth beast that's got iron teeth and it's stronger than all the others. And we read that it has ten horns. There is almost universal acceptance that what Daniel is seeing here in Daniel chapter 7 is simply another picturing of the very thing that Nebuchadnezzar dreamed about back in Daniel chapter 2. Uh, let's keep reading. <clears throat> Actually, let's skip to verse 15 because he gives us, an, or he's told an interpretation about this dream that he just said. He says, I, Daniel, was grieved in my spirit within my body and the visions of my head troubled me. I came near to one of those who stood by and asked him the truth of all this. So he told me and made known to me the interpretation of these things. Those great beasts, which are four, Watch this, are four kings which arise out of the earth. Okay, back in Daniel chapter 2, Nebuchadnezzar's dream, right? Head of gold, chest of silver, legs of uh, belly of, of bronze, and legs like iron. Four world-dominating empires, the first being Babylon, succeeded by the Medo-Persian Empire, then coming Greece, then coming ancient Rome, which was stronger than all the others. Daniel here has a vision of four beasts, and the interpretation of these are four world empires okay these beasts verse 17 which are four are four kings which arise out of the earth but <clears throat> excuse me the saints of the most high shall receive the kingdom and possess the kingdom forever even forever and ever again let me just read to you a quote from david guzik here the divine interpretation of the dream of daniel chapter 7 shows that this vision covers the same material as Nebuchadnezzar, Nebuchadnezzar's vision in Daniel chapter 2, which described the rise of four empires, each succeeded by the kingdom of God. Verse 19, Daniel says, Then I wish to know the truth about the fourth beast. It's, it's, it's this fourth beast that is the one that seems the most intriguing. And why it becomes important for us is again, we can look historically at, okay, Babylon, the Medo-Persian, the Greek, but we need to concern ourselves with what is the kingdom of the Antichrist going to look like? And it's going to be an extension of elements of Rome, okay? The legs of iron going into ten feet with ten toes, ten kings, ten horns on the beast, okay? Verse 19, then I wish to know the truth about the fourth beast, which was different from all the others, exceedingly dreadful, with its teeth of iron, its nails of bronze, which devoured broken pieces and trampled the residue with its feet, and the ten horns that were on its head. And the other horn, and, and this, by the way, is a reference to the Antichrist himself, the other horn which came up before which three fell, namely that horn which had eyes and a mouth which spoke pompous words whose appearance was greater than his fellows." So Daniel sees this on this fourth beast, it's got these ten horns, but out of these ten horns comes up another horn with eyes and a mouth speaking pompous words. This is where, if you've ever heard people refer to the Antichrist as the little horn, this is where this comes from. Because Daniel sees coming up out of these horns another separate horn which will have power over them all. Verse 21, Daniel says, I was watching and the same horn was making war with the, against the saints and prevailing against them until, verse 22, the Ancient of Days came, much like in Nebuchadnezzar's dream when that mountain came and it was the kingdom of God and struck the kingdom of the iron and clay that had the ten toes. Here we see the Ancient of Days coming and a judgment was made in favor of the saints of the Most High and the time came for the saints to possess the kingdom. Verse 23, thus he said, the fourth beast shall be a fourth kingdom on the earth, which shall be different.
from all other kingdoms and shall devour the whole earth, trample it and break it in pieces. Watch this. The ten horns are ten kings. That's exactly what we read in Revelation chapter 17. Revelation chapter 17, verse 12, tells us very clearly the ten horns are ten kings. Here Daniel says the ten horns are ten kings. This is the same thing. Daniel is seeing the same thing that John does. Who shall arise from this kingdom and another shall rise after them. He shall be different from the first ones and shall subdue three kings. He shall speak pompous words against the Most High, shall persecute the saints of the Most High, and shall intend to change times and law. Then the saints shall be given into his hand, oh, for a time, times, and half a time. How long is that? Three and a half years, 42 months, 1,260 days. Same time period. But the court shall be seated, and they shall take away his dominion, praise the Lord, to consume and destroy it forever. Then the kingdom and dominion and the greatness of the kingdoms under the whole heaven shall be given to the people, the saints of the Most High. His kingdom is an everlasting kingdom, and all dominions shall, shall serve and obey him. So Jesus will come back, the Ancient of Days, that mountain, right? Strike the kingdom that's partly of iron and partly of clay with the ten tones, and all the nations of the earth will topple, and Jesus Christ will set up his kingdom. This fourth beast with the ten horns that both Daniel and John see, the Ancient of Days will come back and he will topple that kingdom. He will topple the kingdom of the little horn rising up out of these ten kings speaking pompous words. But we read how the saints will be delivered into his hands and he will make war against them for three and a half years. Exactly what we read about in the book of Revelation this morning. Why take the time to go into all of this? Well, Paul, when he was leaving the city of Ephesus, said, I have not shunned to declare to you the whole counsel of God. And there's more that we could talk about. People are like, please, no, you know, no more. But my point is this. We have a tendency. This happens all the time as a pastor. People read the book of Revelation. They say, I don't understand it. And then. You take the time to go through it and people say, uh, I don't really know if I want to study this this much. I'm okay not understanding it. Yeah, but the problem is when people who are lost come to you for answers. Because you actually have the answers right here. And we can study it. You know, John today in Revelation chapter 13 says, here is, the, here is wisdom I mean, he straight up tells us we can know what these things mean. But if we're going to do that, I mean, we've really got to do what Scripture says and be diligent to present ourselves approved to God, a workman who does not need to be ashamed. Listen, rightly dividing the word of truth. What we just did today was divide the word of truth. We took a passage from Revelation chapter 13 and we went back and we showed how it's connected to Daniel chapter 2, Daniel chapter 7, and we see how all of Scripture correlates. And I believe as, as Christians, especially in the day and age that we live in, we should devote ourselves to the study of these things so that we truly do have understanding. Now, I'll say this, I don't think we should become overly obsessed or fascinated by these things. Ultimately, I believe the study of prophecy should be for us coming to greater faith in Jesus. It shouldn't be to win arguments. You know, I've, I've seen people over the years, you know, they just, they get to that point where they're up, at, you know, late at night drinking coffee and they're surfing the web and they're like, what was he saying about Switzerland, you know, and they're ignoring their kids and ignoring their family and they're calling in sick every day because they're at home shuffling around in their bathrobe and it's four beasts, you know, and it, we don't, that's not where we want to get. But I do believe we can have an understanding. I don't think we know everything, but we can have an understanding of what these things are about. There is a final kingdom that is coming. And it will have elements of ancient Rome. 
Ten kings, ten toes. But one king over them, the Antichrist, this little horn speaking pompous words, the Bible says, blasphemies against God. I believe that, you know, I've said this before. Um, when I was growing up, when we used to do puzzles, uh, first step, you know, you take the puzzle, take the, uh, the lid off the box, and you dump all the pieces out. First thing you got to do, you turn all the pieces over so you can see what's on the, all the pieces. And then, we, you know, you set the box up where you can see the picture. And then my mom was really big on, okay, the first thing we want to do is look for all the pieces that have a straight edge and and build the framework because now okay the framework's built i can see the picture i got all the pieces and then you start filling in all the details i believe we are living in a time when the pieces have been dumped out we can see the picture the framework's built and rapidly the details are getting filled in and i believe jesus is coming back soon and I, I believe we can be excited, but I believe we should be out there busy about the work of our master telling people the good news of Jesus Christ. Amen? Amen. Amen. Father, we love you so much, and we just want to go out today worshiping you, looking forward to your return. Father, thank you for your word. Um, I pray that by your spirit, you just go and make sense of all this, and I pray it wasn't confusing, and I pray we can go back and uh, listen again. Father, just thank you. Thank you for your goodness toward us. Thank you for your promises that you're coming back again. Lord, we love you. May we be found faithful in Jesus' name. Amen. Why don't we stand? Let's go out worshiping.